Good morning. My name is Frederick Randall. I'm a junior at Alabama A&M University, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, one main topic of a book that I read that I found pretty informative by the name of Brainwashed by Tom Burrell. Um, I picked it up because uh, there was a black bookstore down the, there is a black bookstore down the street from my university called Expansion Bookstore which if you're in the Huntsville uh, area, Huntsville, Alabama area, I would definitely recommend you go there. He is a great bibliophile who has a great, a depth, a deep pool of knowledge of a little bit about everything, especially as it relates to black literature and the history of uh, the African American in the United States and uh, oh, of course in Africa as well. So please go by and patronize uh, that bookstore and tell them that Frederick Randall told you to go there. Thank you. But um, I was there, and he uh, he saw that I was there with another friend, and, you know, I saw this book, and uh, I was drawn to it. And um, he said, check it out. And I picked it up. I began to read it, and I was really struck by it. There were a lot of points that uh, he made that I felt down to my core that, where we just were parallel about. I agreed with him on about everything that he said. Um... But the main one that I really want to talk about today, because I really could just go on and on and on and on and on about this book, is about why we as African Americans in the United States of America overspend. I mean, disproportionately, we overspend on items that are going to depreciate rather than buying items like pers like uh, real estate that will continue on you can possibly make money off of. You know, continuous money, revolving money. Um, yeah, I could, and I really felt like I really felt that went down to my core, where I just needed to say something about it because I see it over and over and over again throughout my whole life. I have witnessed people, especially the black people, because I'm I'm from Montgomery, Alabama. Um, yeah, that's a pretty important place, right? <laughs> and, and I would just see how people would just. Overspend. Like, I would literally go into certain areas where I know you can look at the neighborhood and see this is not like the cream of the crop, Beverly Hills type of place. You're not going to see, you know, you're not supposed, you're not expecting to see like a Bentley parked outside of someone's home. You wouldn't expect to see that where, you know, you can see a neighborhood where they're clearly making, you know, ends, where they're trying to make ends meet. But the sad reality is, I actually did see a Bentley pulled, at, parked into someone's yard in this neighborhood. And the person lives there. I know people who know the individual who lives there. And it was, it was kind of, it made me scratch my head a little bit. Because I'm thinking, well, here you are living in this little bitty home. But you have a Bentley parked outside of your house. I said, you know, two and two are not... You know, going together and getting the four. Things are not making logical sense. Not at all. And um, it, 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 it troubled me for some years. So when I read this book and I saw that chapter, I said, oh my. It invoked some emotions and some deep-seated memories that I have had throughout the years. And it expressed them in the book. And I felt that I, might, I must share them with you the viewer. So please, pick up the book, Tom Burrell. If you've read it, please comment. If you haven't read it, disagree, agree, would like to add on some more, comment. If you like what I say and would, like, and would be interested in some more videos by me, please subscribe. Tell other people to come and view some of my videos. Please do. But yes, let's. Uh, I'm now going to begin to actually talk about um, why we as uh, African Americans overspend on items so that are personal property, like cars and uh, clothes. Um, let's begin. Well, during slavery, um, the African American was completely robbed of his sense of identity and taken and brainwashed, uh, uh, brainwashed to so that his black pride, pride in his black people was completely taken away. Where once they were proud to have their dark skin and loved to see the curly hair that they had and to see a black woman as a queen 
uh, it became where the black woman was evil, vile, something that was just a tool for the for the the plantation owner just to have a, as a bed warmer to make sure that his bed literally was warm, uh, just a toy to have fun with, um, where he, just another tool just to get another child to uh, work and toil in the fields or inside of the home for years and years to come. Um, uh, the black man was just a um, was was also robbed of his sense of identity, uh, where he was just of course used. To, as a tool, chattel, property, not a man, you know, not allowed to educate himself, not definitely not even allowed to read after some slave rebellions and revolts and conspiracies. Um, that they were completely robbed of their sense of identity. They didn't really know who they were. They didn't. They felt ashamed to be black. The lighter your skin was, the better you were viewed, and even within the slave community. And of course, that also fosters some jealousy within the slave, the black slave community, um, because a, a lighter skin complexion child was going to be treated a lot better than a darker skin child, simply because their skin was lighter. And white me meant freedom. Dark black skin meant bondage. And very labor intensive bondage um, and you know when you were outside or you know of course you know we're talking about the of course the big plantation slavery that of course existed in the uh, in Alabama Mississippi Louisiana Texas Georgia South Carolina uh, uh, geographical area there were some others but when we think of the cotton kingdom you're definitely talking about Alabama Mississippi that's what led to their statehood in um, 1817 for Mississippi, 1819 for Alabama. Um, when you're talking about that big slave plantation, um, you, you, you're talking about people who were um, outside working in rags, not, the, not like a, a Brooks Brothers suit. You're not going to be out there working in that. And, you know, these people, the slave owners who were planters, you know, people who owned 20 or more slaves, um, sometimes in extreme cases owned up to 800 slaves in extreme cases. However, the typical planter owned, you know, more than 20 slaves. But for these slaves that you did own on a plantation, you know, planting for that cash crop cotton or sugar or rice or whatever, you know, you're not really focused on clothing them. You're focused on making sure that they get their money, get get the cotton out of the field so that you can continue to make money. Um, you're not really focused on clothing them in the best and nicest of, of clothes. So they would walk around in clothes and just maybe sacks, not really have shoes, until the winter time came. And it and it was it was very hard. It was very hot. It was, you know, very uncomfortable. You know, after a while your feet do get hard. Um, but, you know, it's still, you know, when you look at uh, your master and your slave master and you see that, you know, he is dressed, you know, very dapper and um, here you are dressed as uh, this throwaway pretty much working for, you know, him, then, you know, it, uh, you know, you, you just view that this is the way you're supposed to be for a little while. You have a, you have an idea that, you know, I'm supposed to be, uh, you know, I'm supposed to be uh, uh, dressed better and treated better, but, you know, there's a bit of ex acceptance that goes on. You know, you say, well, um, especially since they were indoctrinated with this whole Christian idea that, you know, you were, some people are born of a low status to serve, and, you know, that was, and that the black people who were, were really dark, black people in general, were made to, into that lower um, they were made into that lower class of people who were to become the mud seal for America. Um, you, you, you eventually, whenever you do get a chance to buy something, you then just dive in it deeply. You know, those clothes that you have, that you go buy, that, that car that you may go buy, the rims that you put on the car, you know, that label that you buy, it becomes a status symbol. It says that I've made it. Even if you're living in a in the projects, you know, having this, you know, box Chevy or BMW or a 
you know, Lexus or any luxury item, it becomes a status symbol. It says, I've made it. You know, I, you know it, it's, it's illogical. It's completely, you know, I can see the reasoning, reasoning behind it, but it doesn't really make much sense. You know, it's not something that, you know, one who is really uh, monetarily responsible um, would would do you know it's not in the best interest to go buy this Bentley or you know be in debt with this Bentley, um, but those are the roots. Those are the roots. You know when you're snatched and when your self identity and your pride has been taken away from you and you see that you've almost been reduced to paupery, um, you buy things just for status symbols. It that's all that you can. That's all you really know to do is. Just buy things. It'll it'll make you feel as if you are the rich person, or you know that you have a lot of money. It'll make you feel that way. I mean, regardless if you're still poor, it's a status symbol. And I'm glad that Tom Burrell pointed that out because until I read that, I had an idea of it, but I never was able to conceptualize. And to actually put do a little bit of a historical analysis as he has done to be able to set, to write um, that they're just status symbols. That's why. And I, so much of the Southern culture and just the I guess you can say the Black culture is just consume, 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 buy, 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 buy it now, pay for it later. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, as soon as I get the money, I'm gonna buy it. I have to have this label. I have to have you know Ralph Lauren. I have to have this. This uh, Brooks Brothers suit, you know, but in, in reality, you don't have to have it. You can buy, there are many cases where people just had one suit and just wore black and white over and over and over again. Just wash them. And then you'll eventually get to where you may be able to budget and buy that suit within reason, you know. If you're only making $22,000 in an economy like 2012, you don't need to be going to New York City or any other fine clothing area and buying a suit that has a thread count over 1000 or maybe even over 500 because those suits are going to run you or going to cost you at least 500 to $1,500 on the cheap end. Um, for one for a um, one thousand range for the one thousand three account, maybe five hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred for five hundred three account, but you don't need to be buying those. That's, that's just not necessary. You need be content where you are for right now and budget and try to save enough money in order to eventually get that suit when you ascend it a little bit and your income level um, but sadly the people of the African American race don't really see that it's it's hard to you know to actually get that across to them because if a lot of them and a vast majority of them are below the poverty line level which poverty in and of itself is a bit of a depression um, so it's hard to explain to a person who's grown up poor and to a certain degree depressed as a, as a as a consequence of their poverty um the question is how do you begin to change that mentality how do you begin to change that and that's something i've begun to actually um, that's something I've actually begun to begin to think about myself. I, I really have, um, because I would like to be able to see the. Um, I would actually like to see this mentality, you know, be rid of. I would love to see that. And um, what you'll see, as a matter of fact, within the book by Tom Burrell, uh, Brainwashed, is he does point out positive propaganda. Uh, in order to change and to reverse that the brainwashing that has been done to the um, to the African American within the United States, um, but I'm not going to completely give you give you those. But I will definitely tell you, it's successful. 
and he definitely has a mastery of the material because he has worked in the uh, advertising industry for 40 years and he's an uh, inductee to the Hall of Fame. So um, he knows exactly what he's talking about. So please, read the book and subscribe to my channel. I'm going to be posting some more videos. This is the first. This is actually my first take. I just I was going to get on and I'm just going to just talk about what I felt, you know, pertinent to that one topic because I could uh, just continue talking and talking and talking. As you see, I've been talking for about 15 minutes and uh, 50 or 40 something uh, seconds. So please, 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 please subscribe, comment, refer some more people. You know, I always love to engage in discourse with other people and you know, other scholars to learn more. And if, you know, you view that I said something wrong, misspoke, please comment. I will not, you know, take offense. I just want to see more people become engaged and to acknowledge that there is a problem um, within the African-American community with their mentality. Um, and I just wanted to hit on that one topic. There are several topics within the uh, within that book and within the black community that which really need to be to be discussed. So please comment, subscribe, refer more people. I thank you so much. My name is Frederick Randall, and this is the first of many videos. Thank you. Bye bye.